What's the difference between a carbon plate or carbon rods? Nike versus Adidas. In this video, I'm going to go through a bit of a story talking about why Nike has a carbon plate and why Adidas has carbon rods. Also, I'm going to shed a little light on how product design works in a large company, as well as talk about some of the differences between the two technologies and why they were developed the way they were. So if you're new here and this sounds interesting, subscribe and you'll see more content like this pop up in your feed. Otherwise, drop a like on this video. It helps this channel continue to grow. With all that being said, let's get started. Two things before we start, though. One, I don't work for Nike or Adidas or in the running shoe industry or athletic industry. I've said this before. I have no connection to anything, any brands I'm talking about in this video. But I am professionally a product designer, and I have pieced this story together through what I've seen in social media, uh, interviews with product designers and managers involved in both of these product uh, initiatives, as well as just being a runner and a product designer and understanding how these products have evolved. Second, as a product designer, I do have a lot of background working with carbon fiber mostly in longboard skateboards and snowboards, but a little bit in snowboard and ski boots and bindings. So I understand a lot of the forces and properties of carbon fiber, specifically how it's applied to the foot, or at least trying to get energy return out of it, which is really the goal of a snowboard or a longboard skateboard in the first place. So with both of those things being said, let's finally jump in. In 2017, Nike dropped this, the Vaporfly 4%. This was the original uh, super shoe that sort of kicked everything off. Now, there was a bunch of technology that was in this shoe that was quite important, and Nike had spent years, literally, I think, five to six years developing essentially this, this uh, shoe and a lot of the technologies in here. And... One of the, the real sort of important pieces of this was that carbon fiber plate and how it's sandwiched between two pieces of super foam, or at the time that everyone was calling it super foam, but now we know it is Nike Zoom X foam, and we've seen it quite a lot in quite a, quite a few shoots. Now, if you look at this, uh, this image, you'll see the yellow line. The yellow line is essentially tracing where the plate sits in the shoe. So what we have here is a flat heel, a dip in the midfoot, comes very close to the forefoot, um, and then goes back up into the toe spring. Now, I would argue that that curve is what makes the Nike Carbon Plate so special, and it's also what makes the Vaporfly so unique. There isn't really another shoe that feels like a Vaporfly, and it's not just the foam. I think that that midfoot curve is what's really important because that's a second sort of spring within this plate that a lot of other manufacturers only have a single spring. And this geometry of this plate is so important that we've seen it carried across into the Vaporfly Elite. Now the Vaporfly Elite was never a consumer shoe. This was what they gave the you know elite athletes and really this was the breaking two shoe. This is what um, the original breaking, breaking Two athletes ran in, but you see that the plate, that curve, is essentially the same plate. Now, the Vaporfly Elite turned into the next percent, so the next percent one and two that we got essentially were, you know, from the Vaporfly Elite, not necessarily the four percent, but you see the yellow line. The plate in this shoe is the same configuration, and even in the new Vaporfly 3, it's the same configuration. So Nike has carried this plate geometry with Zoom X, sandwiched in Zoom X, through all of these shoes. Additionally, Nike has really protected all of this with patents. Nike has patented almost everything about this geometry of this plate, its configuration, the layup, the amount of carbon, the type of carbon. Literally everything in this shoe has been patented so that no other manufacturer can touch it. That's not to say we, we haven't seen other carbon fiber plate shoes. We have, but none of them have this exact configuration. And that is Nike being aggressive, defending their position, defending their technology, 
and they still do that to this day. And again, this carbon plate, this specific geometry, size, layup, this is the magic of what the Vaporfly is and really what Nike developed through all those years of research and testing. Now, let's get to Adidas. So Adidas, around 2018-19, they were, again, on their back foot, just like every other running shoe brand. When the Vaporfly came out, it changed everything literally overnight. And I would call 2019 really as a period of all the other manufacturers trying to catch up. And it was the idea of just put a plate in it. And that's exactly what Adidas did. And we got the Adi Zero Pro. So this was Adidas taking a racing flat, which is what they were known for and what they did really well, uh, and putting a carbon plate in it and calling it a day. You know, again, no one really understood, I think, the magic of the geometry of the Vaporfly plate, as well as its how it interacts with ZoomX foam. So this, again, you can see in this cutaway, this was Adidas's first attempt at making a carbon fiber plate shoe. You can see in this photo, the plate is extremely flat. There's a little scoop up in the front. And also, as I remember, the forefoot of that carbon plate had a little bit of a uh, concave uh, shape to it. It was like a spoon, a very mild spoon, as I remember, which stiffened it even more. It's very. This shoe was very harsh to run in. I had actually forgotten until I saw this image that there was actually more boost foam in this shoe than I remembered. I remember it being all Light Strike Pro, but regardless, this was Adidas, like every other brand, taking a racing flat, putting a carbon plate in it, and hoping for the best. And it was a failure. This shoe did not work. No one ran in it. None of their elite athletes ran in outside of press events. It just, honestly, it kind of sucked. Um, it was harsh was not fun to run in, had none of the magic of a Vaporfly. It just didn't work. But in parallel to this, there was another person at Adidas that I think understood some of the magic of the Vaporfly and decided to pull together a team, but a team in sort of skunk works fashion. And what that means uh, within a big product company like Adidas is when it is a skunk's work team, that is a team that's sort of top secret or need to know. It's outside of the rest of the product company. They're not sharing anything that they're doing with the rest of the product organization. They may be taking information, um, you know, research and, and testing and all the other stuff that they're doing across the organization. They're pulling that in, but they're not sharing anything out. And I think that was the right move for Adidas because what we got out of that was the Adios Pro. And the Adios Pro was not the Adi Zero Pro. The Adios Pro was a very good shoe. But something interesting to look at in this photo, you can see the seam in the midsole that starts flat in the heel, dips in the midfoot, goes fairly close to the outsole in the you know, ball of the foot, and then scoops back up into the toe. How was Adidas able to do that? This is not the exact same geometry that, you know, the Vaporfly has, but it's similar. And I, I would say that that midfoot dip in the plate was quite important. And I think that's one of the real things that Nike's really defended because we have not seen any other manufacturer really do that besides Adidas. But Adidas thought of another way around it. So in this cutaway, you can see what their solution was. Now, the one piece of the story that I don't necessarily know is where Lightstrike Pro comes from. Because chemically, Lightstrike and Lightstrike Pro are two totally different foams. They have nothing to do with one another. I don't know if Lightstrike Pro was something Adidas was developing maybe in another line like basketball or something that the team here saw the properties of, properties of and they're like, yep, that's what we want to use. Because Boost was on its way out. It couldn't compete with ZoomX. It was also too heavy. It wasn't going to be sort of the performance racing foam that they wanted. So the Adios Pro built on Lightstrike, but I think the engineers understood Lightstrike Pro's qualities. 
where ZoomX is soft and bouncy and benefits probably from a full carbon fiber plate, which will give it some torsional strength. It will help stiffen it overall, you know, across the length of the shoe and the width of the shoe. I think Adidas's engineers realized that because Light Strike Pro is firmer and denser, but it has the same resiliency. And again, I have a I have a video about foam resiliency card on the screen, link in the description. But since they have similar energy return properties, ZoomX and Lightstrike Pro, I think Adidas's engineers realized that they didn't need a carbon plate in Lightstrike Pro. I'm sure they tried it. I'm sure they found that it was just too rigid, too harsh, probably a lot like the Audi Zero Pro. Uh, it just didn't work. So they developed the rods. Um, I think the rods are a unique Adidas design and engineering solution that only could have really developed out of using Lightstrike Pro. Also, Adidas has said this in, in many interviews, product managers have talked about this a lot, that Adidas also wanted a marquee technology that could be their own, that they could brand as their own, and that was the rods. Nike had the plate, you know, Adidas had the rods, they called them energy rods, and as you can see in the Audios Pro, we had the four foot scoop of the energy rods and there was a carbon plate actually in the heel but they were two separate things and i actually think this is how adidas got around um the patents that nike had with the single plate but this also allowed them to kind of begin to explore new types of performance with rods in light strike pro specifically they carried the same configuration through into the audios pro 2 but in the Audios Pro 3, Adidas now moved from Energy Rods 1.0 into Energy Rods 2.0. And the 2.0, as you can see on the right, is now one piece. They now removed the four foot rods with the carbon fiber plate in the heel, and they just have one rod thing that goes from the heel to the toe. And in fact, the heel area that sort of joins everything um, they actually call the pretzel and it actually looks like a pretzel, but that's their actual product name for it. But this now allows them to really tune how the rods work and really what's unique about rods that's different from a carbon plate or carbon fiber plate is that think about it this way in a carbon fiber plate, you have one plane essentially. Yes, there's a curve in it, but you have one piece of material. Now, like I said, I've worked a lot with carbon fiber. Most of that's been in snowboards and longboard skateboards, which, which are considerably longer platform than, say, a running shoe. But carbon fiber is a great material to control, flex, energy return, twist in something. But it's not, it requires a lot of material, heavy resins, you know, a lot of stuff to really tune it that works in a snowboard, you know, because that's a big plane and it can be much heavier than a running shoe. But when you're talking about a carbon fiber plate in a running shoe, Nike is actually fairly limited to what they can actually tune into that plate. I have no doubt that their plate, you know, maybe has some different carbon fiber material in it. They've done the layup a little differently. They've engineered some flex into that plate but it doesn't give them the freedom in that small surface area of what's in a running shoe to really tune it, you know, really, really to the nth degree. Whereas the energy rods that Adidas has do allow them to do that. So the designers uh, and engineers at Adidas can now take the rods, since there, there are five individual rods that, that go under the major bones of the foot, and into the toes, they can tune those rods individually to get different properties across the width of the shoe. Meaning they can make the toe rod very rigid, very stiff, very thick. So you get that carbon fiber pop off toe off when you're rolling forward, but they can tune the pinky toe and the fourth toe rod to be softer. And in fact, here's a video still from a video that I had saved a long time ago. I can't find the video, but I have the still of it where there's a Adidas engineer showing exactly what I'm talking about. He's showing how they're tuning those outer rods around the pinky toe and the fourth toe 
to be softer whereas you can even see in this photo that the the rod with that little scoop isn't the one that's under the big toe that's much stiffer and much more rigid this allows adidas to control the sort of torsional rigidity of the shoe to make it softer on landing and more um, propulsive on toe off which again with a single plane of a carbon fiber plate like what nike has it's harder to do it's not that nike isn't doing that. I think Nike's tuning that with the foam. I think they're doing a lot of sculpting of the uh, midsole and the outsole, the sidewalls of the foam. And you can see that very clearly in the Vaporfly 3. And if you run in the Vaporfly 3, you can actually really feel it. The landing is smooth. The toe off is propulsive. It is still a Vaporfly. That was, that was in the Vaporfly 1 and 2, the next percent 1 and 2, but it wasn't as pronounced, I think, as what you're feeling in the Vaporfly 3. Now, that is, in a very uh, high-level overview, why Adidas has rods and Nike has a plate. It's two different teams solving an engineering problem in two different ways and not trying to overlap patents, but also understanding the materials that they had and developing their own technology that's going to suit their materials the best. I hope you found that interesting. Again, this is me sort of being a product designer, just kind of riffing on what I've seen over the years between these two technologies. It's a really interesting evolution, and I think we're, we're continuing to see new evolutions. And I do think, and I've said this in other videos, I do think Nike is getting ready to just change everything with their running shoe line in the next couple of years, two to three years probably. And I think Adidas is as well. It feels like with the Prime X development, there's a lot of stuff going on there that's going to trickle into the Audios Pro platform eventually. Maybe not in the four, but definitely by the five or six. So exciting times ahead as, as runners. And I think product design wise, there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening. So thank you for watching. If you're new here, again, subscribe. You'll see more content like this pop up in your feed. Otherwise, drop a like on this video. It helps this channel continue to grow as always. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.